and I'm going to give her the screen and she is going to take it over from here. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luann, for all of your support and help with this. And I'd also like to thank Osteoporosis Canada for the opportunity to pre pre present um, to uh, everybody across the country today about my little role in FLS here in Nova Scotia. I've been working with osteoporosis patients for the last uh, 20 years and been an FLS coordinator for the last five years. Um, in my career, we have tried so many things to narrow the huge osteoporosis care gap and it's so exciting um, to be in on something sort of at the ground level in Canada um, to see something that actually improves um, care for these patients patients, helps to prevent fractures and does close the care gap. So I just want to know that I have no disclosures to make. Um, some of the topics that I hope to cover today is uh, how important the first eye is and optimizing the patient interactions that we have. Um, very limited time to do sometimes in clinic and how we fit in into the clinic, um, how the FLS coordinator works in the second and third eye. I am a two eye FLS. I'm a registered nurse, not a nurse practitioner, so I don't prescribe. Um, looking at the follow up and how important it is to continue continually monitor uh, the fracture liaison service to always want to improve and make things better. Um, I wanted to link this discussion a little bit to the eight essential elements of fracture liaison service that were developed here um, by Osteoporosis Canada. Uh, the design of the FLS here at Dartmouth General and in the rest of Nova Scotia makes sure that we do meet all of the eight essential elements for an effective FLS um, as developed by Osteoporosis Canada. So on the top of the slides, you might see underneath the title EE and the number. Um, just trying to, to kind of link a little bit about what our day-to-day -day activities and how they link into those essential elements to make sure that we're effective. Um, I know that they overlap and I know that they're not necessarily in order when you see them. So if you do have any questions around why I linked what where, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, the number one essential element for any fracture liaison service is that there has to be a dedicated coordinator to perform the role. And when we look through uh, the things that I do in my day-to-day -day life as a uh, fracture liaison coordinator, um, you'll see that there's absolutely no way that this could be done off of the side of somebody's desk. Um, we have tried many interventions over the years to do this without a fracture liaison service or without a coordinator or with so, without somebody who owns the job, and none of those has ever worked. It's been proven time and time again. So again, that's why I'm so excited to be um, a part, be a fracture liaison service uh, person, um, just as we're getting started to, in Canada, really with with the service. Um, so the first thing that we do, um, let's start with the first eye. That's the very critical thing. And you'll see that the second essential element is proactive system-wide case finding of any new fragility fracture. Um, and that's a critical thing, and that's where the fracture liaison service coordinator shines. It's our goal always to leave nobody behind. So we work as hard as we can to make sure that we pick up every single uh, fragility fracture of the fracture type that's included um, and, and screen them for whether or not they should be in the program or whether or not they need the complete osteoporosis screening. So for me, um, I get a list of all of the clinic appointments for any of the outpatient orthopedic clinic List provided to me usually the day before uh, the, the clinic takes place. And I go through those lists quickly looking for the initial criteria. The lists are very basic. They have the patient's name, birthday, health record number, and their body part. So basically I look for anybody over the age of 50 um, who has a fracture of the hip, wrist, shoulder, pelvis, um, Usually spine fractures aren't seen in orthopedic clinic. So I, I look over that list and I identify any patient that looks like they might fit into the criteria that I should see. I give a list of all of the patients that I've identified to the clerk in the orthopedic clinic. Um, my office is miles away, from, it's not really miles away, but it's a long way away from the clinic in the basement of the hospital. So I can't sit in the clinic and wait for the patients to come to me. I have too much other work to do. So the clerk will actually phone me when my patient is in and when they're, they're, they're ready to see me. So it's great to have the cooperation of the clinic staff to, clinic staff to help us along as well. 
for hip fractures, um, I see a list of emergency admissions every day. So anybody who's admitted through the emergency department, it's de-identified, so I can only pick out the hip fractures um, or the uh, other fractures that might be admitted, but usually it's hip fractures, um, and make a list of those people. And then it's important to optimize the best time to see them. You want to, um, a lot of our hip fractures, as you know, are older and they have dementia, they have, um, it's difficult sometimes to do the assessment. So it's always best um, with family is present. Um, and you also want to do it a couple of days or a few days after they've had their surgery because they're not going to remember you if you see them too close to their surgery time. So it's optimizing the best time to go and talk to those patients. Um, so, and I also have a fracture liaison service here at Dartmouth General, and I'm unique in that way for vertebral fractures. I screen all of the x rays that go through. Um, our radiologist here at Dartmouth General that would document a vertebral fracture and look for those compression fractures greater than or equal to 25%. I'm not going to go into very much detail with this because I think as far as I know I'm, I'm fairly unique. I think there might be a couple other vertebral fracture um, FLSs across the country. So that's the first screen through. The first part of the first eye is just to identify the patients over 50 who've broken. Then we go to the clinic, and when I go and meet with the patient, um, it's a matter of seeing if they actually should be enrolled in the fracture liaison service. So once a patient is identified, we need to assess to ensure that they can be included. Um, and again, uh, looking at the essential elements, it's which fracture type um, and the essential elements say that we have to target at least one of the WHO major osteoporosis fracture type, which are hip, wrist, shoulder, and spine. So I know some fracture liaison services just see hips, um, which would mean that they're meeting that essential element. We see all of them, plus pelvis we've added then in as well. So once I um, know that the patient has a wrist fracture, it's making sure that it's the right bone because a wrist fracture is really a distal radius fracture. And from the clinic list, you can't tell whether it's a distal radius fracture, an ulna fracture, or a scaphoid fracture. So sometimes it's a matter of looking up the x-rays um, to find out where the fracture is. Um, and then talking to the patient um, to see how they actually broke the bone. And this is, as you all know, who are FLS nurses, sometimes the most difficult part because um, whoever decided to name a fracture, uh, an osteoporosis fracture, a fragility fracture, um, it's very difficult uh, to convince the patient sometimes that it is a fragility fracture depending on how they fell. So if the patient tells me that they've fallen down the stairs, then obviously it's a traumatic fracture and I don't need to see them versus a fall from standing height or less, which would be a fragility fracture. Uh, to optimize the time that I spend in clinic, I do try to know some of this information before I go in to see them. Um, the mechanism of injury is often found in the emergency department record, but I do always check in with the patient anyway because sometimes stories change and sometimes the emergency department record might say that the patient fell on the steps so when I go see them, I either find out that they fell up the steps, which would be a fragility fracture, or that they fell down the steps, which would make it a traumatic fracture and they would be excluded from the FLS. Um, this is an opportunity though, for those patients who have had traumatic fractures um, to get some information on nutrition for healthy bones, because I always give them that even though they aren't enrolled in the, uh, in the fracture liaison service. Um, I also exclude patients who have a current osteoporosis specialist. Uh, in Dartmouth, we have, in the local area, we have two osteoporosis specialists. And if that patient is being followed by them, they certainly don't need to, to see me. So what I do is I send a note to that specialist and let them know that their patient has had, had a fracture so that they can follow up with them. Um, I also exclude patients who um, have so many comorbidities or have comorbidities that are significantly reducing their lifespan. Um, if they're palliative, um, we don't see them. Uh, the patients give consent to the assessment. Um, I always ask my patients if it's okay to talk to them. Uh, they, they do consent to the assessment. I very, very rarely have somebody turn me down. Um, 
when I first started in the role, I remember one lady, I, I went in to see her and she had a broken wrist and she said, I don't have osteoporosis, I absolutely am not talking to you. Um, so I didn't see her. I saw her a few months later with a second broken wrist and she said, no, I don't have osteoporosis, I'm not talking to you. And then shortly after that, I saw her with her wrist broken again and she said, Carla, I think maybe I better talk to you this time. So it's always, um, you know, consent, but that's a very rare occasion. For the most part, people do agree to the assessment. Um, here in Nova Scotia, unfortunately, I can't include any patients who don't have a primary care physician. So we integrate very closely with the primary care provider. And if I don't have a primary care provider to integrate, I can't order the tests, I can't order the bone density and so forth. So right now in Nova Scotia, we're having a little bit of trouble with that. Um, we have a certain lack of, uh, of primary care physicians, but we're working on remedies for that. So that's making sure that the patient can be included in the FLS and getting the basic information that we need um, to know whether or not to proceed. Once we know that the patient has had a fragility fracture, then it is time to start the actual assessment. Um, the essential element, number five, says the fracture liaison service must determine fracture risk by a validated fracture risk assessment tool. In Canada, we have CAROC and FRAX, and in Nova Scotia, we use FRAX as our fracture risk assessment tool that we use. Um, so I complete the assessment for FRAX and get information on um, all of the independent risk factors that we need to plug in to the FRAX tool to complete the fracture risk assessment. Um, I use a checklist uh, to complete this assessment. The checklist helps to optimize the time that I spend in the clinic and helps to keep things on track. It also is becomes a part of their permanent record, so it is my documentation tool. Um, and it makes sure that I don't forget uh, to ask certain questions. So I collect all that information from the patient um, and I um, also ask them for their height and their weight at the time. The clinic is so busy, we don't have scales there, so it is just asking for their height and weight. But it's important to have that because if they fail to make their bone density appointment, then I can go back and look at that height and weight and still complete their fracs. Um, without a bone density result as it's still validated. If I can't get their height and weight from them, sometimes I can find it on an old chart entry. And it makes sure um, by being able to complete that at FRAX without BMD that I can actually work on the second eye and complete the second eye. Um, I do a quick falls history. My falls history pretty much is how many times have you fallen in the last year. Uh, if the patient has fallen more than twice, then or two or more times, then I refer them on to our falls assessment clinic um, so that they can be assessed in more detail. I also also ask them about uh, vitamin D and if they take a vitamin D supplement. Um, this always turns into some teaching time with them because most people aren't on adequate supplement when I see them the first time. Um, and it optimizes that patient contact time again so that we can talk about how much uh, vitamin D they may or may not take. And they all leave with a vitamin D recommendation um, to take um, 2,000 international units a day as recommended by OC guidelines. Uh, when I talk to patients about vitamin D, they often have questions about calcium as well. Uh, we don't get into a lot of detail about calcium other than to tell them that we would much prefer them to get it from their diet than to take supplements. The other part um, that we ask them right up front is that they're currently on osteoporosis therapy. Um, many patients do fracture while on alendronate or residronate. Um, so asking them for descri to describe for me how they are taking it, um, it's always um, interesting to find out, you know, if they're taking it correctly because we want to determine whether or not it's treatment failure. Um, if the patient is not taking it correctly, however, it doesn't matter how long they've been on it, it's not going to help them any. So it also um, provides an opportunity to do some teaching if they haven't been taking it the right way. So that's all a part of the assessment. Okay. Um, we want to 
optimize the time that we have to spend with the patient in the clinic. Um, for me, it's finding the right space and time in the appointment. I don't have a dedicated space in the orthopedic clinic, so I find a spot that will do the least to impede the flow of the orthopedic clinic. They see up to 75 patients and sometimes more moving through that clinic um, in a little better than a half a day. So they have three treatment rooms that they use. Uh, sometimes the surgeon will let me into one of those treatment rooms. Other times I find a spot within the outpatient department to see the patient or in the back of the cast room or someplace. So I find the, the spot that will give us privacy but will, will not impede the flow of the clinic. Um, I also find try to find the right time in the appointment. Uh, sometimes I see the patients before they're seen by the orthopod. Sometimes I see the patient after they're seen by the orthopod. So it just kind of makes sense to do it um, whenever it's, again, not going to impede the flow. So very flexible with when I see the patient. Um, we want to have very good communication skills because we can't take a lot of time because they move through so quickly. So it's important to have the right tools to be able to give the patient and it's important to personalize those tools as much as we can to make it um, effective for them. So having good printed material, I use some of the Osteoporosis Canada um, pamphlets um, to make sure that the patient does have some information to go home with them and depending on the patient I circle different different parts in the pamphlet so that they know what information is most important for them. Um, you want to make it as specific as you can to the patient, but keep it as simple as possible. It's also to optimize your patient interaction and getting as much done as possible with as little travel time for the patient. So if we can organize things um, all with one appointment, they always appreciate that. Some of my patients come from an hour or two away and it's always easier for them to, to get everything done at once rather than to have the second, uh, a second or a third trip. So that kind of brings us to the second eye. Um, the second eye is making sure that the appropriate interventions get done uh, for the patient while they are here in the clinic. So the um, essential elements say that the fracture liaison service model must be at least a 2i or a 3i. The 2i meaning that we have the um, identification of the patient and the investigations done. And 3i would add the initiation of treatment to that. Um, and it's also very important to integrate with a primary care provider because that's a critical component of any FLS. So for the bone density test and the test that I need to order for them to optimize the time that I have in the clinic, I try to look up when they have their last bone density and when they've had their last spine x-rays and I only order new investigations if those tests were done more than a year ago. So um, oftentimes I can come in with their T-score if they've had it done within the last year. Um, and we can complete the fracture risk assessment on the spot, meaning again, it's point of care and we get the information to them as quickly as we can. Um, like I said, the bone density test is only ordered if they haven't had one in the last year. And it's not necessarily ordered if the patient presents with an automatic high risk situation. For example, um, if the patient comes in with a hip fracture, uh, I'm not necessarily going to order a bone density test for them. I use some clinical judgment here. If somebody is very young and they've come in with their hip fracture, they, um, it provides a very good baseline for them. But if they're 92 years old and they have difficulty getting around, a bone density test is not going to prevent a fracture for them. They need the medication they don't need the bone density test. So it doesn't really matter what a BMD says, so we don't actually order that. Some of them request it and they want it, um, in which case I will, but it's not gonna tell us anything that we don't know already. Uh, as it is point of care, I order spine x-rays to assess for compression, compression fractures and the routine osteoporosis screening blood work when I first see them. Um, sometimes I can get the bone density tests done on the day that I see them. I walk over, our orthopedic clinic is very close to where our bone density uh, tech 
is and where the bone density machine is. And sometimes I can go in and say, Judy, do you mind? Will you do a bone density test for me? And she'll try to squeeze them in. Uh, I save that for patients who are traveling from far away uh, just to make sure that uh, I don't over overstep my boundaries there. Um, so again, it's making sure that we have that 2I, that those investigations needed for fracture risk assessment are completed and that the fracture risk assessment is completed. Um, and this is also the first time that I integrate with a primary care physician. So when I see the patient for the first time in clinic, I send a letter to the primary care physician and let them know that their patient has had a fragility fracture, that I've ordered the tests, and that I've copied all of those tests to them. So the, the um, patient knows that I'm communicating with their family doctor and the family doctor gets that note from me. Uh, so it's important to communicate because they're the ones that are responsible for the ongoing care of that patient. Um, I, the, I have a medical directive that allows me to work outside of the scope of practice um, of an RN in order to order the tests. So across Nova Scotia, all of the fracture liaison service nurses can order a bone density test, can order routine osteoporosis screening blood work, and can order lateral views of the thoracic and lumbar spine. And that's by pa been passed by our provincial medical advisory committee. Um, and uh, we also talked to the College of, of Registered Nurses here to allow us to do that. So once I have all the data together, then I complete the fracture risk assessment. Like I said, I determine fracture risk using FRACS. Um, so plugging in their, uh, their T-score uh, from their femoral neck, all of those other independent risk factors, their age and their height and their weight. Um, and I will determine whether their patient is at moderate or high risk for repeat fractures. According to Osteoporosis Canada guidelines, all patients who present with a fragility fracture are at least at moderate risk. Um, so we never see a low risk patient. Um, so if the patient comes back, um, the, the radiologist, sorry, the radiologists here in Nova Scotia use Karoc to interpret the bone density test. Um, so occasionally when I use FRAX and they use Karoc, our risk assessment differs. Um, so it's great here, the radiologists have all agreed that FRAX will be used for patients within the FLS. And a note is in all of the letters that go out to um, the family doctors here in Nova Scotia that uh, essentially says, listen to the FLS nurses uh, fracture risk assessment over hours if they differ. And also there's a macro in the reports that go out um, to the family doctor uh, the, in the BMD reports that say, the FLS nurse uses FRAX to complete the risk assessment. Some of that data is not available to us in the radiology department, so please listen to the fracture liaison service nurse. Um, it doesn't happen very often, um, but usually what happens is they will say that the patient is at high risk, and I will say that the patient is at moderate risk. It doesn't often go the other way, but it can. Um, I'd say that it differs probably around maybe one in eight or one in nine times. So that completes uh, the second I, so the patient's fracture risk has now been determined. So we will move on to the third I, and that is the initiation of treatment. Um, so the essential element says that first-line osteoporosis medications must be initiated or recommended for all high-risk patients. And again, this is another communication point with the primary care provider. So if the patient comes back at moderate risk, I send a note to the primary care provider saying that treatment is not normally needed for moderate risk patients and that patient is discharged to their care. I also send a letter to the patient that says the same thing, that they've come back at moderate risk um, and that I will no longer be following them. I call it our divorce papers, so the patient knows that they're gonna get a letter in advance um, once they have their bone density test done and I determine their fracture risk. So moderate risk patients are discharged. So it's the high risk that we worry about for the third eye. Um, the, 
at this point, a letter goes out to the primary care provider saying that treatment is recommended. I send Osteoporosis Canada guidelines with all of the first line medications um, needed for treatment to the family doctor. I send a request for coverage form if the family doctor wants to order something other than the oral bisphosphonates, which are automatically covered by our Pharmacare program. And I also send a letter to the patient recommending that they make an appointment with their family doctor to discuss their bone health and that they are at high risk. I call this my patient's nag letter. I tell them that I will nag them and make sure that they get on treatment. Um, I do suggest a referral sometimes to patients um, if they fracture uh, while they're on treatment, if they fracture under the age of 60, or if they have complex medical comorbidities, um, such as renal dialysis. So some things are outside of the scope of practice for the FLS nurse, and I always make a recommendation to the primary care provider that it's a good idea to refer. And then it comes time to follow. The goal of fracture liaison uh, service, the biggest goal at all is to get the high risk patient on treatment. And in order to know whether we're successful, we need to follow up. So our first follow up is at six months, three to six months, I try to do it closer to three. Um, and at that point, I'm looking in to see if they have been started, um, and to see if they're taking it correctly. If they are not, then I send a letter to the family doctor that says, uh, your patient is not on any medication for their osteoporosis, they need to get started on something. So we, it's an, a reminder letter or an adherence letter just to make sure um, that the family doctor knows that we're, we're checking in to see. If they're not on treatment, we make another call at six, six to nine months. Again, we try to make it closer to six. Same kind of thing, are you started on treatment? Um, if not, I send another follow-up letter to the family doctor. Uh, if they were not taking treatment um, correctly, if they had been started and weren't taking their medication properly at three months, I'll do a six-month check-in because I've provided them with some information at three months, know this is how you take it, and I'll make sure that they are taking it correctly. Um, then I follow my patients for a year. Um, it looks like when we look at the evidence, it looks like if as long as we follow them for a year and keep them on treatment for a year, then they're more likely to stay on treatment than if we, we don't follow them after that three month follow up time. Um, our policy, our protocol basically says check in if they're on treatment at three months, you don't need to check in again with them for um, until a year. I find the more you, you talk to them though, the, the better luck you have to keep them on treatment. At one year, I give them a call and ask them if they're still taking their treatment correctly, how they're taking it, and I touch base to see if they have fractured again. So I follow everybody for a year. At the end of that year, I discharge them, and the family doctor will get a discharge letter from me that says, your patient is on treatment and taking it compliantly. Thank you, the care is now turned over to your hands, or I send them a letter that says, your patient is not on treatment, all high risk patients should be on treatment for their bones. So that basically covers the three I's, the identification, the investigations, and communication with the family doctor about risk, and follow up to see if the patient is on treatment or not. I also spend a lot of time in my practice um, teaching um, my patients about osteoporosis and about what a fragility fracture is. Um, so what is a fragility fracture? That's the biggest thing, you know, a fall from standing height. But I fell really hard, Carla. I fell on concrete, Carla. It's, it's trying to teach them exactly what a fragility fracture is and that fragility doesn't mean that you didn't fall hard and that it didn't hurt like Hades when you landed on it. It's, it's more about um, that it is a fall from standing height. We spend a lot of time talking about vitamin D and calcium and protein and diet in general. Um, that happens mostly during the first time I see them, but oftentimes they'll call me with questions around that afterwards. We talk about fall prevention. I don't um, give out a lot of information and in pamphlets on fall prevention. It's more around environmental safety that we have discussions about. Um, I talk about how to move safely, specifically with the spine fracture patients. Um, sometimes if a patient has had a vertebral compression fracture, those first few months after that first fracture puts them at very high risk for more fractures. So we wanna make sure that they're sneezing right and coughing right and getting in and out of bed the right way. 
Um, I also refer patients to physiotherapy for education on safe movements um, because our physiotherapist here is bone fit certified and she probably is much better teaching that than I am. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about what is moderate risk versus what is high risk and what does that risk really mean. Uh, a lot of patients get hung up on, on what uh, their bone density test is going to tell them alone. And it's important to teach your patient that it's not just bone density um, that makes us decide whether or not they need to be on treatment for osteoporosis. Um, it takes into account other things as well. Um, I have a little story I tell them about uh, cholesterol um, to a heart attack versus bone density to a bone attack. Um, I like calling their fractures bone attacks rather than fragility fractures. It makes it sound uh, a little bit easier for them to take. Spend a lot of time about how to take the medications, the proper way to take the oral bisphosphonates, um, the, the importance of making sure that they get their prolia injection at six months and that they don't want to wait too long in between injections or make sure that those arrangements are made. Um, talk a lot about the prescriptions um, for osteoporosis and the side effects of those prescriptions um, that atypical femur fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw are very, very, very rare and not necessarily the big scary things as they're portrayed in the media. I think one of the key things with the fracture liaison nurse and in my day-to-day -day life is um, every kind of time that you can touch that patient and I call them touch points. It's optimizing communication with the patient. It's optimizing hope that they will get on treatment and that they understand their treatment um, and that they'll stay on their treatment. So every time I see them is kind of a touch point and I haven't done a study but anecdotally it seems that the patients that I see the most tend to be the ones who get on and stay on their treatment. So I'll pop into clinic and see them when, when they come in. Um, I saw a lady today, She it's not quite time for her three month follow up, but I know she's at high risk. So I just wanted to touch base with her. And it was a great opportunity because her daughter was there and she had some questions as well. So, you know, she, her daughter's helping me to convince her, you know, mom, it doesn't matter what that bone density test says, you still need to be on some medicine for your bones. She had a hip fracture. Um, so when they come into clinic for follow-up, um, and I try to make everything as I can, as easy as I can for them. Like I said, um, I, I can try and arrange a same-day bone density. Everybody isn't as fortunate. Um, but if you can, if it, anything that you can do to help them and to make it easier for them, it builds trust and rapport with them. And, and then they, you know, they follow through when they have their bone density tests done. Um, I... I follow them to make sure that I communicate their fracture risk to them. Um, sometimes you know it's okay to send your patient a letter and sometimes you just know that you need to phone them up and tell them what their fracture risk and how they turn that turned out. Um, so the first check-in is, you know, is this a fragility fracture? How did you break? And then the second check-in is you are at high risk and we need to do something to help reduce your risk of having another break. You need to have some medicine for your bones. And then I check in to make sure that that they, they got the medicine and that, that they're taking it correctly and I answer any questions about that. Um, and then I check in to see if they're still taking it. And then at the end, when I, when I discharge them, I tell them that it's a long-term commitment and make sure that they know that and leave them with my phone number. So anytime you have that opportunity, and I think that's the difference with a fracture liaison service and why it works is because we're here and we answer their questions and we kind of move them along through the process to make sure that they, uh, that they get on their treatment and they understand their treatment. Um, I also teach group education sessions. So in Nova Scotia, we have the Dartmouth Osteoporosis Multidisciplinary Education Program, also called the DOME program. Um, so we teach um, patients in group setting from all across the province. So we use telehealth here. I, we broadcast from Dartmouth, but the other fracture liaison nurses in Cape Breton and in the Valley also refer patients um, to the program. It's been around for a very long time. We've tailored it now to work with fracture liaison service. And those very keen patients um, get four hours of education on what osteoporosis is and risks and side effects of medications and the medical management of osteoporosis and safe movement education and fall 
prevention and healthy eating from a dietitian. So it's myself, um, an osteoporosis specialist, a physiotherapist, and a dietitian. Um, it's also a good time for follow-up for me. Um, I check in with my patients, make sure they're on their treatment, make sure that they're taking it the right way. And with any program, whether it's fracture liaison service or any service that we have in a hospital to provide support to our patients, it's very important that we do continuous quality improvement. Um, one of the essential elements states that data must be collected to determine the FLS's ability to close the post-fracture care gap. And we need to know if we're being effective, to know if we need to make changes. Um, we want to make sure that we have the right processes in place and we need to collect um, data all along the way of those processes um, to make sure that we make changes when we need to. Um, so we do collect data um, all along the way from the time the patient is identified. Um, they're included on a spreadsheet, um, as well as reasons why they might be excluded. Um, so that is maintained throughout the whole time that we care for the patients here. Um, when treatment is initiated, we want to know when treatment gets initiated for the high-risk patient. We want to know if they're still on that treatment after a year. We want to know if they've completed their bone density test. All of the things that are needed um, for the key indicators for Canadian fracture liaison services are maintained on the spreadsheet that we use to collect the data. Um, we use the data to make improvements. Um, for an example, uh, I was missing hip fractures for some reason when we first started out. I was only picking up about half of the hip fractures and that was because I was depending on um, somebody else to help me out with that. So somebody on the unit was supposed to call me whenever the hip fractures came in and uh, that happened sometimes, but only 50% of the time. So looking at the data of the number of hip fractures that do come into Dartmouth General and the number of hip fractures that I saw, uh, we determined that we needed to make an, a, a change in the process. Um, so that's when we started uh, getting the emergency admission list forwarded to me so that I could find all the hip fractures that they that as they come in. So looking at um, where things kind of fall off the, the wagon is important and we use that data um, all the time to look at those things. So I just have a, just a little picture. I know it's kind of tiny, but it's what our spreadsheet is. And our checklist that we use to look after the patients, the documentation tool, and this is just a little tiny piece of it. I didn't put the whole thing in. It, they all match up to the columns in the spreadsheet so that we can keep track of all that information. And whoever enters the data into the spreadsheet um, can have that sort of at their hand. So we collect data to look at, are we getting our high risk patients on treatment? Because that's the most important thing. So why me? Why do you need to have a fracture liaison service coordinator? Not um, why can't somebody else do it? Well, in, cl in clinic, our staff are seeing 75 or more patients a day. They certainly don't have time uh, to go through lists and to pick out all the patients that they need to see. Um, the nurses don't always even see all the patients that go through, through orthopedic clinic. Sometimes it's just the uh, the cast tech or or just the orthopod and the clerk that that see the patients. Um, and time spent in the clinic is is really just the tip of the iceberg. We are a very specialized service, so we need to follow up on the bone density tests and X-ray results as we've ordered them. We need to communicate with the primary care provider, and we need to follow patients when they're gone. So that's why it's so important that we have. Have, um, a dedicated person to do the job. And that is the first essential element that we do have dedicated fracture liaison service staff. Some of the challenges that we face is that patients are always um, a little different. So we have form letters to go out for patients, but one form letter certainly doesn't fit everybody. We're always having to write a little thing that's a little bit different. Um, we have perceptions of patients and other healthcare providers to deal with all of the time. So first, the biggest one is, is that it's not a, a fragility fracture, that they fell really hard and anybody would have broken. Um, it's very difficult to communicate the perception of risk, what's high risk, what's moderate risk, and what does that really mean. Our, our medications have a bad name and the media doesn't do us any favors there. So um, we spend a lot of time trying to talk about atypical femur fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw far more than one of those things would actually ever happen. 
Um, there's a perception that medication takes too long to work for old people or that people are too old to treat and they're old and they're supposed to break anyway. Um, so all of those things are challenges in, in convincing people that treatment is necessary and that it works. Um, some of the other challenges are the day-to-day -day things, right? Is anybody ever home? So it's very difficult to uh, follow up with patients sometimes. Um, they've moved to a nursing home or they're snowbirds, they've gone to Florida for the winter and you can never actually get a hold of them. So that um, becomes a problem sometimes. And, and time management is very big, you know, time to do it all well. So clerical support is so important. Um, and when there's nobody, when I'm sick or if I'm not here, there's nobody actually to replace me. So those are some of the challenges that we face. The rewards are many. Um, the rewards come from patient satisfaction and knowing that they trust me. Um, I put down Carla Bones there. One lady has me in her cell phone and she, my last name is Bones because she knows that I'm all about her bones and she can call me easily. Um, one lady stopped by, one of my first patients that I had, stopped by almost a year later, her husband happened to be in and she stopped by my office and she said, Carla, I don't know if you remember me, but I'm, st I'm on my medication and, and I fell down and I fell really, really hard and I didn't break anything and I wanna thank you for that. Um, so you'll have patients that will say, you took time to answer all of my questions. Nobody ever takes time to answer all of my questions. Um, one of, uh, my patients came back at moderate risk and I had a note from the, uh, the osteoporosis specialist that said, I just wanted you to know that your patient believed you more than she believed what her family doctor, she wanted her to do. The family doctor had wanted her to start on treatment, but her frax was actually low, even though her Karoc was high. So she sent, uh, she was sent to see the specialist and the specialist actually concurred with me. So that, that's very rewarding to me. Um, when patients say you can nag me all you want, or when other healthcare providers call with questions and you can answer those questions or you can find the answers for those questions for them, it's always very rewarding. But I guess the biggest reward of all is knowing that the patients are started on treatment and that we are doing all that we can to prevent the next fracture for them. So in summary, in a day in my life is, is trying to make sure that I capture all of those fractures that come in of the, of the bones that we cover, um, screening for fragility and making sure that the primary care provider knows that the patient has had a fracture, organizing the test results that are needed um, to determine a, a good and accurate fracture risk assessment, um, doing quick fall screening um, and communicating with the primary care provider and making sure that the patient gets started on that first line treatment, making sure that their vitamin D levels are optimized and making sure that we follow up with them and make and know that they know how to take their medication and that they're sticking with it. So basically all is lost without the fracture being identified and as a fracture liaison service nurse, we're the best ones to identify them and um, get the, the treatment started. So if we don't capture all the fractures and we don't have a fracture liaison service nurse, then it's all for naught. Um, communication, um, using those touch points as every opportunity to ensure adherence to the medications. Um, and unless the right patients are identified, nothing else matters. So that's basically a day in my life as a fracture liaison service nurse. Does anybody have any questions for me? So thank you, Carla. It's Luann here, and I'm the fracture liaison service manager. And so I'm looking at the question box. We'll give everyone a few minutes to uh, think about that. But I see you all so kindly put your email up there and even your phone number, so we'll see who, who picks up the phone and calls you. <laughs> and I'd just like to say, to say that your slides were, were great, your information was great, and most importantly, I had the pleasure of, of shadowing Carla one day and seeing how competently and carefully she builds the relationships with both the patients and the, the staff that she interacts with. So it's uh, the patients, even though they might be unfortunate in getting a fracture, they are fortunate when they uh, connect with her. Thank you. <laughs> So it's 3.47. I don't see any questions in the question box. And that just might mean they have to ponder a little bit more. Or it might mean that you were so thorough that uh, they, they have nothing to ask. 
so I see a couple of people are starting to leave. Um, we do, uh, we'll, we will be having this uh, presentation archived on our website soon. Uh, it won't be today or tomorrow, but it will be soon. And so, and there are other ones already there. So if you enjoyed this one and you want more information, you can go to the FLS portion of the Osteoporosis Canada website and you'll see some archived webinars there with, with a wealth of information within them as well. All right, check the question box one more time. I don't see anything. And so I think it's a sunny day here in Nova Scotia. So uh, we will sign off and any questions, send them along to Carla or you can um, find us, find my name on uh, email on the Osteoporosis Canada website as well. So Carla, thank you so much again on behalf of Osteoporosis Canada for sharing your knowledge and your time with us. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye.